And now we're just going to interview uh, Kevin. Um, Kevin, come on down. Just to find out from a, a younger person just why they'd put themselves through all of this. Uh, so Kevin, tell us, um, why did you get involved with YWAM? And, um, and why are you here on Ibiza? Um, well, I was, I'm Lance's son, so I was born and raised in a missionary family, but uh, that doesn't mean I was going to be a missionary, to be honest. Um, I decided to be a missionary once God spoke to me, personally. Um, I didn't want to be involved in YWAM, to be honest, because, you know, I grew up in it. Uh, <laughs> but God humbled myself. <laughs> well, I had to humble myself, and then God confronted me. Um, and I'm here, I'm in YWAM because it's a place where I realize where I can give a lot and also receive a lot. Because, uh, sadly, a lot of uh, ministries, because you're young, you only can serve uh, physically, but not also like spiritually, or you can't, like, I, there's a limitation, and with youth with a mission, uh, it's a place where young people can do a lot also, but also receive a lot, so that's why I'm here, and I'm with Ibiza, I'm, I'm in Ibiza right now because, well, it's part of our, our reach, <laughs> so I'm just going with uh, what I've been told, and to be honest, I've been liking it a lot here, it's really cool, people are really open to hear from God, um, and open to hear what you have to say. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, I actually saw them in action yesterday and uh, it's amazing some of the work uh, that they've been doing already. So thank you Kevin. Oh, my pleasure. And uh, let's pray for them. So Heavenly Father, we just thank you for uh, the YWAM team represented here, but also those who are uh, spread across this island today. Lord, we thank you for the vision that created YWAM and for the many millions of people who have been impacted by its ministry over the years. And Lord, in this week of uh, Christian unity, we thank you that in heaven there's no labels, that we all serve one God and we serve one kingdom. And that we can be united as brothers and sisters in Christ to serve you and to see your kingdom come. So Lord, we just pray now that you would be with us during this service. That, Lord, that you would speak to us, you would touch our hearts, and you would transform our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to have a little uh, testimony slot. Angie is going to come up and share something of her story. So uh, come on up and use the microphone. It's always great to hear people's testimonies. I always say it's sort of, in a sense, prophetic in what God has done for them, and he can do also for you. Good morning. Good morning. Um, so my name is Angie. I am 19 years old, and I don't know if you've ever felt um, depressed, lonely, or empty, um, but I have, and that's why I'm telling you this today, my story. Um, when I was 13 years old, um, I had to leave the country where I grew up in because of the situation that that country was going through. Um, so we left. Um, to another country, and it was very difficult for me, um, having to adapt to a new culture, um, having to leave behind all my family, uh, my friends, my school, and everything that I had built up until then. Um, the adaptation for me in school was very difficult, so my parents were all the time working to support the family, and so I was alone all the time. And um, I started to feel um, lonely all the time and that led to a depression and I started going on a cycle of block and everything was dark for me, everything was, I, I felt really lost. So um, that depression led me to start thinking, um, start having um, thoughts of suicide and um, I spent the majority of time thinking um, ways to end my life and yeah um, and every time I tried to end with my life there was something that told me like don't do it there's more than your depression there's more than your loneliness in this life for you and at that time I didn't know but now I know that that's something that told me that was God taking care of me. Um, time later, um, my parents started attending to a church and they took me with them. And um, I noticed that there was something different in that place, 
something that I was looking for in other places and I didn't find. And there was something different to the places I used to go, like, like to parties or school or the group of friends I was in. And I started having a, like, a hunger to look for what was that different in that place. And today I can finally say that I found what was that different in, in that place and it's God. And I now know God and he took away all my depression. I held up all of my depression and all my loneliness and he filled up all the emptiness that was there. And in the past I would try to fill it in with many, many things and it didn't, and it didn't succeed. But now I feel fully because of him and Wow, I just <laughs> get a little bit nervous because it was very drastic change for me, how I saw the things in my life, how I was feeling, um, how um, the people that surrounded me by that time, everything changed in a long, in a time, period of time, and now it's incredible what God has done for me, and I know it can do it with you too. So, thank you. <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, thank you so much, Angie. Let's just pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Angie's testimony of how, uh, even when she was far from you, that you broke into her life. And Lord, we pray now for others who may be experiencing similar uh, issues, either to do with mental illness or suicidal thoughts or just feeling that there's no point in life. Lord, we just pray that right now you would break into wherever they are, that you would provide hope, that you would bring healing. Lord, you would bring the assurance that they uh, and we are loved unconditionally by you. So, Lord, thank you for, for Angie. Thank you for the boldness she's had in sharing uh, her story. And, Lord, we just pray as she uh, serves with YWAM and on into the future, that, Lord, that you will do amazing things through her testimony and through her life. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Uh, we're going to have prayers now. And Danny is going to come and lead us in our prayers. Yes, I'm just, if we could all just stand together and pray. Mm. Um, yeah, I just, just like to pray, pray a blessing over um, this church and mm. what God is doing in and through all of you. Um, and so, Heavenly Father, thank you so much for um, the church that you set here and you've planted here, for your people that you've, you've um, planted here. God, it's not coincidence, it's not accident, oh God, that each and every one of us are here together. Um, Thank you, Lord, that you've commissioned us and you've called us to be your people, oh God. And I just ask, Lord, for, um, that you um, breathe strength, oh God, into each and every person here, oh God, that you breathe a new life, oh God, um, that you raise them up to be men and women who unapologetically and unashamedly go out and preach and speak and share of your love and of, of your heart for the people of um, Ibiza, oh God. Thank you, God, for each and every life here that is a light um, for you and for for your kingdom, oh God. Um, I just ask, oh God, that you will continue to be their strength, oh God, they continue to be the wind in their sails, oh God, as they go out and um, go about their day to day, oh God, in their circles and in their families, oh God, that they will be the light, oh God, um, that you have called them to be, oh God. And I just thank you, Father, for, for everything you're doing. I pray, oh God, that today will be a day where new connections are birthed between us and this church and YWAM, oh God, and um, that you help us to be able to build each and every, um, build each other up, oh God, that um, as we as we um, set out to, to do your work. Um, in Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you. Uh, have a seat, and uh, Elkie's gonna come and bring us our Bible reading. Well, good morning. Um, he makes me tremble when I do the readings. That's why I like it. <laughs> um, the, this reading uh, this morning is taken from the Old Testament, from the second book of Chronicles, chapter 7, verses 1 to 3. When Solomon finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices. And the glory of the Lord filled the temple. The priest could not enter the temple of the Lord because the glory of the Lord filled it. When all the Israelites saw the fire coming down and the glory of the Lord above, 
They knelt on the pavement with their faces to the ground and they worshipped and gave thanks to the Lord saying, He is good. His love endures forever. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Elke. Uh, so over the last uh, few weeks, we've been looking at some of the big storylines that run uh, from cover to cover uh, in the Bible. We began by looking at Jesus. Uh, we then looked at uh, covenant last week. And this week, I want us to look at God's presence. It's a storyline that's crucial for our understanding of the holiness of God, but also the depth of intimacy that he wants to have with each one of us. There's actually an awful lot to unpack to try and cover God's presence from cover to cover uh, in the Bible. So I'll be skimming over some of the stuff this morning. Otherwise, we'll be here all day. Um, but I will send out some information later, Bible passages that you can use to dig in and do your own study and research over the coming week. But first, let's begin at the beginning in the Garden of Eden. And as of, we've already seen in previous weeks, God created Adam and Eve for fellowship with him. We read about how Adam and Eve uh, walked uh, in the garden with him and talked to him face to face. But then after they disobeyed God, they were so ashamed to be in his presence that because of their sin that they hid themselves away from him. And then once Adam and Eve were banished from the garden, they realized what it was to be outside of God's presence. Looking around, they no longer saw paradise. What they saw was parched, barren, desolate land. And as they looked at each other, they saw that their bodies aged. Don't we know it well? What was the difference between the garden and the wasteland? What was the difference between this place of life and this place of death? Well, the difference was that in Eden, God chose to manifest his presence. And where the presence of God is, there is life. Years later, God manifested his presence uh, in the desert of Midian to uh, a, refuge, a refugee called Moses. You know the story well. On the one day when he was out looking after the sheep, uh, Moses saw this burning bush and God was there. And as Moses approached the bush, God said to him, take off your sandals. The place that you're standing on is holy ground. Think about it. Back in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve were able to walk freely with God. They didn't have to follow any particular rules like that. But now that sin enters the world, we find that Moses has to take off his sandals before he could approach God. In a sense, to, in an attempt to remove anything that was impure before drawing near to God's holiness. It's a bit like when you go around to someone's uh, posh house and they make you take your shoes off at the door so you don't walk any dirt in. A bit like that. And so from the outset of this storyline of the presence of God, we see that the presence of God is not something to play around with. God is someone to be feared and respected. And when we come to him, we come in awe and with reverence. And although God is holy and so therefore should be set apart from anything that's sinful, he still longs to dwell with his people. And so what we see is that by giving Israel the law, he sought to create for himself a holy people. And by setting the, the tabernacle and the strict regulations around it, he sought somewhere to live among his holy people. The regulations God are giving his people are, are more to sort of say to them, look, I want to be with you, but also I want you to make an effort to take this seriously because I am holy. The tabernacle was the place that the very presence of God, this holy and separate God, dwelt in the midst of his people. Another name for tabernacle is the, the tent of meeting. And in Exodus 40, we read about how God took up his residence in the tabernacle. It says, Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses could not enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled upon it. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Have them make a sanctuary for me, and I will dwell among them. This was no small thing for a holy God to come and to live among unholy people. 
And when you look at the plans for the tabernacle, then we discover there's increasing zones of holiness. There was the outer court, there was the holy place, and then there was the, the most holy place. And it was in the most holy place, the holy of holies, that the presence of God rested. And this was separated from the rest of the temple by a thick veil. It's maybe difficult for us in the 21st century to understand the rituals that had to be carried out before going into the tent where God lived. Some of them seem really odd. But as I was reading about this, someone likened this ritual to the same sort of ritual that you might go through going on a first date. If you think about it, on a first date, you probably wash yourself pretty well. You select the right aftershave or perfume and, uh, and you choose the right outfit to wear. And you do that because by making an effort, you hopefully get to sit in the presence at dinner or maybe on the sofa of the person that you want to engage with. And you can do that with a little bit more confidence. And as we read these passages, we see that God tells the priests the smell he wanted them to have, the special clothes that they were to wear and the equipment that they were to use. And they did this out of awe and respect for a holy God. They made an effort when they came into his presence. But that's not all. Only one priest at one point in the year was allowed into the presence of God in this holy of holies. And that day was called the Day of Atonement. To atone is to make up for sin. And the word atonement comes from three English words, at one meant. So to atone is to make up for sin, but it's also about bringing about a union, a oneness between us and a holy God. So all this stuff about tabernacles and incense and what we had to do came down to the basis of a relationship, of a friendship between a holy God and his unholy people. It comes down to attention that on one hand we worship and we serve a God who is mighty, independent and beyond comprehension. And on the other hand, he's a God who delights in us and he wants to dwell with us. Uh, there's a story in 1 Samuel chapters 4 to 6 that tells us a little bit more about what it is to have and to lose the presence of God. The people of Israel were, were sort of getting beaten up by the Philistines. And so they had this idea that they would take the Ark of the Covenant from the town in Shiloh where it was. This Ark was uh, symbolized the presence of God. It was made to house the, the, ten, the stone tablets of the Ten Commandments. It also housed the staff of Aaron that had miraculously blossomed uh, and a jar of manna that God had sent to feed the Israelites in the wilderness. It was the centerpiece of the Holy of Holies and God uh, dwelt above it. But the Israelites uh, figured that if they took this actual physical presence of God into the battlefield, then how could they ever lose? Well, they were wrong. The Philistines beat them, they captured the Ark of God. You see, the Israelites have made the mistake of trying to use God's holy presence as a good luck charm. And if the capture of the Ark of, uh, was a disaster for Israel, then it was a total nightmare for the Philistines. You see, they made the, the mistake of placing the Ark right next to their God, Dagon. And in the morning, the statue of Dagon was actually smashed to pieces on the floor and was actually faced down before the Ark of God. And what the Philistines found was as well that they started to uh, get tumours and they were dying. And they realised that they were being judged in the presence of the God of Israel. And so they put the Ark on a cart, they hitched it up to a cow, and the cow miraculously took the Ark back to Israel. From that story, we learn something about the power of the presence of God. Uh, a famous evangelist posed the question, if, God, uh, was to, if the Holy Spirit was to leave your church, would anybody notice? And that's one of the big questions that every church needs to face. You see, the longing of our hearts for church should be a church that isn't necessarily slick or entertaining or comfortable. What we desperately need as a church is to be uh, a place where we're filled and the place is filled with the powerful presence of God. 
Uh, later in the story of the Bible, we see that King David and his son, King Solomon, uh, built a permanent temple for God in the center of Jerusalem. And another key story to help us understand the significance and importance of the presence of God can be found in 2 Chronicles, uh, chapters 5 uh, to 7. And here we read about the completion and the dedication of the temple. In chapter 5, it says, The ark is brought into the most holy place. The priests, trumpeters and singers all praise God, singing, He is good. His love endures forever. Then the temple of the Lord was filled with a cloud, and the priests could not perform their service because of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord filled the temple of God. And at this point, uh, Solomon gets up and he prays this long prayer of dedication. At the end of it comes the passage that Elke read to us earlier. Where it says, when Solomon finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and sacrifices. And the glory of the Lord filled the temple. When all the Israelites saw the fire coming down and the glory of the Lord above the temple, they knelt on the pavement with their faces to the ground and they worshipped. And they gave thanks to the Lord saying, he is good, his love endures forever. What an amazing meeting. You just wanted to be there. But these stories tell us what it is to live in the presence of God. It's what we were created for, just like being back in the Garden of Eden. We see that God did everything he could to be in the presence of his people. Moses understood the necessity of being in the presence of God. In Exodus 33, he says to God, if your your presence doesn't go with us, that is with the people of Israel, don't send us from here. What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? You see, Moses had learned that there was no point in going into the promised land without the presence of God. It would have been a complete waste of time. You see, it was God's presence that marked the people of Israel as God's people. The truth for us as Christians today is that we aren't generally better looking or funnier or better dressed or smarter than non-Christians Rather, it's God's presence and God's presence alone that distinguishes us from others. Then as we work our way through the Bible, we come to this prophetic book uh, of Ezekiel, probably one of the wackiest books in the Bible. And yet it's a book that is key to our taking us into a deeper understanding of the meaning of the glorious presence of God. We read how Ezekiel saw uh, various visions while the Israelites were in exile in Babylon. In chapter 8, Ezekiel has this vision in which he's transported back to the temple, back in Jerusalem. And in the temple, he's shown uh, four scenes of different people or people of Israel worshipping other gods, other idols. Ezekiel's vision tells us that even the place that God had deemed and claimed for him as a holy ground, his own people chose to worship other gods there. In a spiritual sense, his home on earth had been broken into, it had been defiled, it had been trampled over and scorned. And the holy God could therefore no longer dwell in such a place, and so reluctantly he left his home among the people. The people of Israel, you see, had always believed that, uh, that Jerusalem was indestructible because that was where the temple was, and in the temple, that's where God was. But when God left, then we read that in 586 BC, the king of Babylon uh, crushed the city and destroyed the temple. And yet, having predicted the fall of Jerusalem, Ezekiel went on to prophesy that again, one day, Israel would return from exile. In chapters 40. Uh, to 48 he has this vision of a new temple being built and the glory of the Lord returning to dwell with his people this vision carries echoes of the garden of Eden it describes this river flowing from the south side of the altar and in the Bible of course water often significant sig- uh, significant is symbolic try that word is symbolic of life uh, but also of the Holy Spirit It's when the presence of the living God returns to the temple that life returns to Israel. 
As the river flows out from the temple, this dry, parched, barren, desolate land becomes rich and abundant, overflowing with goodness. And Ezekiel tells us in verse 9 of chapter 47 that where the river flows, everything will live. And he goes on to prophesy that this sanctuary is to surpass the old one. The Lord intends, he says, to put my sanctuary among them forever. My dwelling place will be with them. I will be their God and they will be my people. Then the nations will know that I am the Lord and that I make Israel holy with my sanctuary is among them forever. And what we see is that eventually the people of Israel started to return from exile. And one of the first things they did was to build another temple in Jerusalem. And that's recorded in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. But in the second temple, there's no account of God manifesting his presence. You see, what we have to remember is that it's not about the place that we choose to hold our church meetings. It's about the manifest presence of God. It's the presence of God that matters and not the building. But what of Ezekiel's visions of, of how he predicted that God would return in glory and uh, about this river of life and how it would flow. And of course, that sets the scene for Jesus. As we heard in our Christmas readings, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life. And that light was the light of men. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory. You see the eternal God who made the entire universe... There we go. Yeah. So the eternal God uh, who made the entire universe, the one who sustains everything that surrounds you and me, this God could no longer live behind a curtain in a building where only the chief priest could come once a year. No, this awesome, all-creating, all-sustaining God was born as one of us. Instead of being surrounded by a curtain, he wore a nappy. Instead of being ministered to by priests, he, he was brought gifts by a bunch of foreigners. Instead of smelling incense, he smelt animal dung. This awesome God who could not be seen was stared at by shepherds from the night shift. The message translation says God moved into the neighborhood. Emmanuel, God with us. Meaning that God isn't just standing beside us, but God became like us in every way, except that he had no sin. Mm. On Friday at Peter's funeral, we heard these words from John 14. It says, in my, my father's house there are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come back and take you to be with me, that you may also be where I am. Do you know when we read that passage, so often we miss the point. So often we think about, what's my room in that mansion going to look like? But the reality that we need to grasp is that we will be with Jesus. The point is that heaven is to be in the presence of a holy God. And in the New Testament, as he prepares to, to leave his disciples and return to heaven, Jesus said to them, it is good that I'm going away, because unless I go away, the counsellor will not come. I will send him to you. And when Jesus refers to the Holy Spirit as a counsellor, another translation puts it like this. It says, another like me, implying that Jesus and the Holy Spirit are distinct but similar. The Holy Spirit is the presence of God living in us. And if you're a follower of Jesus, then God lives in you. You are now a holy place. That's the amazing truth about what it is to be a Christian. You don't have to go to a special place to find God. He is within us. We read in 1 Corinthians 3, Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit lives in you? You're God's temple. I was just showing yesterday that we often say we're God's temple. I'm more a cathedral. I'm a little bit bigger. 
but, uh, but the key to Christian living is not how clever, how good looking, how funny, how well dressed or connected we are. The key is God's presence. Moses discovered that back at the burning bush. He protested that he wasn't eloquent enough. He couldn't uh, speak well enough to fulfill the task that God had given him. And God didn't send him off for some speech training lessons. God simply said, I will go with you. And then after the death of Moses, when uh, Joshua was commissioned to lead the people into the promised land, he, God knew that Joshua was afraid. But he didn't help him by giving him a great army. Instead, he said, I will be with you. And then David, that most successful general, the greatest warrior in the history of Israel, sings of the secret of his confidence. He says that even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because you are with me. You see, God has always longed to be present among his people. He's in us right now. He's among us right now. And through his presence, he wants to minister to us by his Holy Spirit. Good morning. <laughs> it has been wonderful to be with you guys this morning. Um, so we are um, two discipleship training schools together in our outreach phase right now. And we are here in the island for, for two weeks going to the streets every day. Like we're doing evangelism and I just wanted to share with you guys a quick story. Uh, a couple days ago we were out in the streets and we were talking to two young girls, I mean like 12 years old <laughs> girls and at the beginning they say they were atheist. Of course they were not but they thought they were. <laughs> and with, with a tool that we use that is some surveys where we ask questions to the people in the streets. Uh, they were like sharing about what they thought and we were sharing about, about our testimonies, about Jesus, about the message of the gospel. And, and it just was starting to change, like their, their thoughts, their, their man, mindset. And at the beginning they said like, oh, so we, we ask a question, like, if, if I, I can tell you that you can meet God now, like, get to know God now, would you like to do it? And they said, yes, yes, I, I, want, to, I want to get to know him as you know him. And, and they, they prayed with us. It is very interesting to hear somebody praying for the first time in, in their lives. And one of the girls was saying, like, okay, God, I didn't know you were here. But, but if you're here, like, I want, to, I want to know you, I want to get to know you, and I want to have a, a relationship with you, that I can talk to you anytime, like, like these people. Uh, so please do, do that, come into my life, I, I want you in my life. And, and we, we prayed for them to, to feel the Holy Spirit or to, to listen to God's voice, and they were staring at each other like, what is going on? I have never felt something like this before. And, and one of the girls say, I, I felt like a huge relief. But this is so strange. I, have, I haven't felt anything like this before. Um, so, they, so they prayed to say they wanted to, to know God more. We challenged them to surrender their lives, but they were not up, up until that point. But we are coming today for a follow-up event because they want to know more. They want to know more about the Jesus in the Bible. So I, I love to see people in the streets just, just change their minds and just experiment the real God. So we are doing evangelism this week. We are having a training tomorrow for English speakers. So Lance is going to lead this, this training. And the content is like, uh, how to share your testimony without appearing dumb. <laughs> That's just the title. <laughs> I, I, I appeared dumb before I was trained on how to share my testimony. So is that uh, we will be training how to use some practical tools as well that can help us with conversation. And we are going up to the streets for practice as well. So don't be nervous, you can partner up with somebody with more experience and you can have a little taste about how to do it, like for real. So, are you going to say something, Lance? No, I, I just, I don't know if you've ever...
felt like you don't know enough, but you want people to know the God that you know, but somehow you need some more training. And it's, and it's really simple once you have the opportunity to have some training. And, and it can become very natural. So the, the, the name of the workshop that I, I give in Spanish is Como compartir tu testimonio sin para tener un tonto. Uh, that, was, that was a very accurate um, translation. You know, how to share your testimony without being dumb. Because people are desperately searching for God. And here on the island, people are searching for something. And, and they, they really need people like you and I that are willing to share the gospel. So um, tomorrow night... Um, at, at 4 p.m. Oh, tomorrow afternoon. Um, we're we're going to do this workshop. It won't be long. It won't be boring. Uh, it'll be practical, um, and I really want to encourage you guys to come and, and learn how to share your testimony, what is the gospel, and how to share it in a relevant, effective way to give people an opportunity to come to Christ. So you're more than welcome. We'd love to have as many as we can.